Okay, I think it's time to start and I would like to welcome everyone, our speakers, our co-organizers uh, from both organizations, uh, the Asia Euro People's Forum and the Japan Council Against ANH Bombs. We'd like to welcome everyone, everyone who have joined us today and you know, give you a warm greetings of good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. And uh, we are uh, indeed uh, uh, happy to be able to do this today um, at a point where, uh, you know, we are in between two very important meetings. Uh, first, uh, you know, two weeks ago, I think we held, uh, there was the, the meeting of state parties uh, in Vienna, uh, where some of our uh, distinguished speakers have been part of. That was not only a gathering of uh, governments, but also of civil society, peace movements from all over the world. Uh, and also upcoming in the next uh, week or so, two weeks, uh, will be the uh, NPT review conference in New York, both dealing with the issue of, uh, of uh, the nuclear uh, abolition, nuclear disarmament. And therefore uh, today we have appropriately, hopefully it is the proper uh, title of this webinar, which we call nuclear catastrophe or nuclear abolition and lifting from a UN declaration and let's eliminate nuclear weapons before they eliminate us. So that seems to be the inspiration of this webinar. It looks at uh, you know, we're asking um, Ambassador Hainoch to give us his reflections, his thoughts, his analysis on possibilities and uh, challenges after the uh, meeting of state parties. And also, uh, we have four uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, coming from uh, four uh, specific countries that basically have been very active uh, as they are also heavily impacted by the uh, presence uh, of the continuing uh, uh, presence of nuclear weapons in our uh, means. Um, of course, um, uh, also uh, I am honored to share the moderating uh, work with uh, Dr. Anu Chenoy of India, who is a colleague in the Asia Europe People's Forum. And, uh, and I think that uh, that should be <laughs> the, the basic introduction that I would like to make. Uh, also that I, I would like to say that we are holding uh, two parts of this webinar. The first one is somehow a lecture part that will be uh, uh, given to us by uh, Ambassador Hainoch, uh, uh, mainly on the meeting of state parties in Vienna and some of his thoughts about moving forward. But most specifically after that, there is going to be a Q&A to give us an opportunity to ask questions uh, dealing with what Ambassador Hainuch have given us. And then a uh, shifting to the second part, which is actually uh, the time for our panelists, uh, four panelists that will speak more about moving forward, uh, about you know, work that is way ahead of us and you know, some resolve into the continuing work for nuclear abolition. So let me now, uh, um, uh, and also I might forget, you know, that we need to, for those of us who need interpretation, uh, this webinar is being, uh, uh, you know, interpretation is available all throughout the webinar. And, 
And to do that, you'll have to look at the lowest part of the Zoom, and you could see the globe in that and choose the language that you prefer. So uh, we have interpretation for English and Japanese for today. Um, okay, and we have two interpreters, um, Michiko and Yayoi, uh, to help us uh, to be able to, to, for us to understand each other. Now, let me uh, introduce our first uh, speaker, our lecturer uh, in the person of Ambassador Thomas Heinoch. And um, he would like to be introduced as, you know, a, uh, a retired diplomat, he said. But I think it is useful <laughs> for me to, to say that he was a director of this armament arms control and non-proliferation in the Austrian Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs. Uh, I think that is also a very important background to give us a sense as to where uh, Ambassador Thomas is coming from. And of course, he was one of, uh, you know, uh, you know, major people who, important people who have uh, organized, uh, help organize the meeting of state parties. And, and because of that, uh, uh, I, uh, we thought that he would be the, the, the most appropriate person to give us the information today and to give us his analysis. Uh, so um, I would end there. <laughs> In terms of introducing you, so Ambassador uh, Thomas Heinoch, you have the virtual floor, please. Thank you so much, Cora, and uh, hello and greetings from Vienna to everyone. It's a pleasure for me to share uh, my impressions of the first meeting of states parties with you. And uh, at the outset, I want to congratulate the organizers on the well-chosen title of this webinar. Indeed, it is fitting in the current situation of heightened tensions as a result of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine, starting a protracted war that is causing so much human suffering and destruction. Russian leaders even threatened to use nuclear weapons. So the quote of the UN Secretary General's message to the first meeting of states parties uh, brings it to the point. If we do not succeed in eliminating nuclear weapons, they will eliminate us. And there is no halfway solution. You cannot compromise between maintaining nuclear weapons that put the very survival of mankind into jeopardy and the world without nuclear weapons. Smaller numbers of nuclear warheads are certainly better than higher numbers, but the risk of the detonation by accident, error, or uh, intention uh, still persists. Whatever path is taken towards nuclear abolition, the prerequisite is the legal norm to prohibit nuclear weapons. We have seen this already regarding biological and chemical weapons. Therefore, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, in short, the TPNW, is of seminal importance. The position of a country on the TPNW is a good indicator whether it only pays lip service to the objective of nuclear disarmament or really wants to achieve it. The opposition of those countries that want to cling to nuclear weapons also in the future has underlined the relevance and importance of the TPNW. As you probably know, the treaty has entered into force in January 21, but due to the COVID pandemic, the first meeting of states parties could not be held before uh, 21st or 23rd June uh, in Vienna. So it's just something like uh, uh, three weeks ago. At the start of the meeting, four additional states presented their instruments of ratification, raising the number of states parties to 65. And gladly, another uh, state has in the meantime uh, also 
uh, completed the ratification process, so we stand at 66 states parties today. During the general debate, 11 of the present observer states announced that they are working on the ratification. The constant increase in the number of states parties will continue. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres invited all countries to consider joining the TPNW. Among the observer states were four NATO countries, Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, and North. Context, the absence of Japan was regrettable, not only for the uh, present Hibakushas. For the TPNW is the only nuclear disarmament treaty and the only nuclear bomb country was widely expected to show an interest in this issue. It was informative to listen to positions on nuclear disarmament of so many countries and NGOs at the first big disarmament conference after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But the main objective of the meeting was to take concrete decisions in order to promote the implementation of the TPNW. They have been prepared in digital consultations uh, over more than one year. This proves again that the TPNW is a 21st century treaty fit for purpose as the strong participation of civil society has become its hallmark. Since all states and all people on our planet would be strongly affected by nuclear war, it is logical to seek the input of NGOs, academia, and international organizations. The first meeting of state parties decided the establishment of a scientific advisory group which is tasked to further enrich the knowledge on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons and the shared understanding of the risks of nuclear weapons, as well as technical guidance. The expertise of leading independent international scientists from different fields will finally be sought and published with a regarding nuclear It's for nuclear armed states that join the TPNW, and, and uh, there was a consensus on 10 years. The maximum period of nuclear weapons from the territory of on victim assistance and environmental remediation, the states parties will establish national focal points coordinate and develop mechanisms for assistance, continue work on developing a voluntary reporting format, and discuss the establishment of an international trust fund. Intercessional work until the second meeting of states parties uh, in November 23, next year in New York, is foreseen also on universalization, the designation of a competent international authority or authorities to negotiate an elimination plan and verify its implementation when a nuclear armed state joins the TPNW. Furthermore, a coordination committee, a gender focal point, and an informal facilitator on tangible cooperation between the TPNW and the MPT were created. The first meeting of states parties adopted an action plan outlining concrete actions to be taken by states parties. Some of the above measures are contained therein and the detailed presentation would go beyond the allocated time span. But it is really very concrete and uh, it's a commitment to undertake uh, many actions. Politically, the most important outcome of the meeting is the declaration, our commitment to a world free of nuclear weapons. And some of its main points are the following. 
the unequivocal condemnation of any and all nuclear threats, whether they are explicit or implicit and irrespective of the circumstances. This wording is clearly stronger than those issued by other multilateral fora uh, in uh, response to the Russian threats. Nuclear weapons do not preserve peace, but only heighten tensions. This highlights the fallacy of nuclear deterrence theories. They are based on the threat or actual use of nuclear weapons and hence the destruction of countless lives and of inflicting global catastrophic consequences. Non-nuclear weapon states that advocate nuclear deterrence encourage the ongoing possession of nuclear weapons. Another important point was uh, growing instability and outright conflict greatly exacerbate the risks that these weapons will be used, whether deliberately or by accident or miscalculation. The existence of nuclear weapons diminishes and threatens the common security of all states. Indeed, it threatens our very survival. The states parties uh, re regretted that despite the terrible risks and despite the legal obligations and political commitments to disarm, none of the nuclear armed states and their allies under the nuclear umbrella uh, are taking any serious steps to reduce their reliance on nuclear weapons. Instead, vast sums are spent on maintaining, modernizing, upgrading, or expanding nuclear arsenals and increasing their role in security doctrines. This has to end and the resources should be utilized for sustainable development. You find in the uh, political declaration a clear recognition of the treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, the NPT, as the cornerstone of disarmament and non-proliferation regime and reaffirmation of the TPNW's complementarity with the NPT. The focus on the humanitarian consequences and risks should be increased in all disarmament processes and the prevention of these consequences must be at the center of our collective efforts to achieve and maintain a world without nuclear weapons. The states parties will not rest until the last state has joined the treaty, the last warhead has been dismantled and destroyed, and nuclear weapons have been totally eliminated from the earth. So there's a very strong commitment uh, that was agreed at the conference. So as you can see, it is a powerful text, not the typical compromise text of a big multilateral conference with many caveats. But states cannot achieve these objectives without active involvement from civil society. It is this cooperation between civil society and states that makes the TPNW so different and powerful. States can only invite other states to join, but the change of the position of a still reluctant state has to come democratically through the people. Civil society has a key role, and I trust that the next speakers will address this in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Hey. That was, uh, that was a lot, but I think that uh, it is also encouraging to note that uh, the uh, meeting of state parties have very clear cut uh, uh, commitments. Of course, uh, um, 
in terms of uh, uh, pursuing, you know, uh, uh, and thank you so much for uh, giving us the most important outcome of the meeting uh, politically uh, through the declaration, uh, which is the state party's commitment uh, to a, a world free of nuclear weapons. And you mentioned, you know, that very, very important points very clearly. Um, and I think that, um, um, you know, the unequivocal condemnation of any and all nuclear threats, uh, that expression is very important. Nuclear weapons do not preserve peace, but they only heighten uh, tensions. True enough, uh, especially in the midst of current, uh, you know, war in Ukraine and not only in Ukraine, but elsewhere. Uh, and uh, of course, it, if we look at the growing instability and outright uh, conflict greatly exacerbate the risk that these nuclear weapons can be used, whether deliberately or by accident, as you said. And then, oh, of course, uh, uh, yet, uh, despite all of these uh, you know, uh, factors, none of the nuclear armed states and their allies under the nuclear umbrella are taking any serious steps to reduce their reliance on nuclear weapons. You know, we could see that for a fact, as you expressed, more uh, money is being spent in terms of research and development. Uh, and uh, very important to note the recognition of the treaty, uh, the NPT, um, as the cornerstone of disarmament and non-proliferation regime. That's why uh, that's, that's part of what we are looking at between these two important uh, meetings, uh, the first meeting of state parties and the upcoming uh, NPT review in New York next month. Uh, and of course, uh, very important to note, very, expressive uh, statement of commitment of the state parties uh, to pursue uh, 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 the continuing work uh, so that uh, the treaty can be implemented. Um, and um, very powerful statement, I guess, and Ambassador uh, Thomas have given us his thoughts on that. And uh, I think uh, we're now open to, uh, we have a, a few minutes of Q&A to deal with uh, the questions that you might want to ask. Uh, um, I think uh, there are comments here that are uh, given. I don't know uh, if there are questions <laughs> already. Uh, it says here, is this a question, Ambassador? It says, which countries are 11 observer countries which are preparing for ratification? That's a question I saw here. Maybe. Uh... Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, unfortunately, I, I haven't it before me exactly which ones, but they are, for example, Brazil is among them. Uh, a number of African states have said so. Also uh, from, from Asia and the Pacific, there were some countries. Uh, they were very clear announcement that they uh, are working on the ratification, but we also know that some other countries are considering uh, to ratify. Uh, so it takes uh, in some countries quite a long while because the uh, national uh, um, process is uh, very cumbersome. And in other countries, it can be done quite quickly. And I think my friend Tillman uh, uh, has also just uh, added something on this. Uh, that you can find uh, here uh, on the screen. 
so Indonesia, Mozambique, Nepal, Niger, uh, uh, Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, Brazil, I mentioned, Ghana, uh, and uh, so now you still myself, you now have a, a, a number of countries. Thank you. So are there other questions um, that we would like to ask Ambassador Thomas? Um, you know, uh, there's going to be a general uh, Q&A after this, after our uh, distinguished uh, four panelists will be done with their uh, with their presentations. Uh, I, and I wonder whether we have more questions to Ambassador Thomas. If you have not asked, you know, type them. Yes, in. there's one question from Kale, from Kale uh, Sekaski, and he asks, what kind of new ways we can find in order to pressure the US, Russia, and other nuclear states to sign the treaty? So this is a question for Ambassador Thomas. Yeah, other new ways. I think uh, uh, it, it's hard uh, to 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 come up with new ways. But as I see it, uh, uh, it is a uh, basically a change of mind that is necessary. And uh, in my own judgment, the major stumbling block is this wrong idea that nuclear weapons can bring security because we all know they cannot. On the contrary, they are really the, the, the danger. And uh, uh, it's interesting when you listen to the argumentation of, uh, uh, for example, US diplomats, and so I say, well, it's not that we want to use nuclear weapons, but uh, we need it. We need it for our security, nuclear deterrence. And uh, I think, what is perhaps a new way that we have to take, and there are already efforts on the way by a number of academic institutions, is to have a real discussion on nuclear deterrence. Because basically, it is a theory. There's no proof that it ever has worked. And uh, there is quite a number of good reasons why it cannot work. So you have on one hand, the technical reasons. In our world today, the cyber hacking, even of command and control systems of nuclear weapons, uh, I mean, would it work? Uh, we all know that uh, cyber attacks uh, use sleepers so that uh, the, the, the opponent shouldn't know that you hacked into the uh, nuclear weapons command and control system. Only in a crisis they would activate it. And then it's the only possibility to find it. So uh, there was a report written by NTI that came to the conclusion that uh, uh, nuclear weapons are unreliable. Do you want to base your security on something that is unreliable? You have other reasons, uh, uh, for example, hypersonic weapons. They are so fast. They don't leave time to deliberate uh, whether to launch a counterattack or not. And uh, so basically, you, you come to a new world where whoever pushes the button first might have done great damage to the opponent and uh, the opponent might not retaliate whether you have now for this nuclear deterrent theory or not. Uh, and then, of course, there are the fundamental issues. I mean, uh, uh, what uh, do you win by launching a counterattack? Uh, so uh, Princeton University did uh, a test with a number of uh, uh, former high-ranking officials of the U.S. administrations, and uh, quite a number of uh, those who took the test did not launch a counterattack, even though they knew that uh, there are many Russian missiles 
uh, coming in because what is the benefit when 100 million people of your own country die? Where's the satisfaction that uh, 100 people in, in another country uh, die? So it's not a weapon that you can use in warfare. It does so much damage to civilians, so, which is totally illegal also by international humanitarian uh, law. Uh, but where's the military advantage? How do you advance in a war by using nuclear weapons? So it's rather a weapon of terror and so on. So analysis, I think it is time that we critically uh, look at uh, this idea uh, of nuclear deterrence, that uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, they bring peace because as long as we have nuclear weapons, the others won't use nuclear weapons, which is not true. I mean, just take India and Pakistan. There were uh, some armed confrontations and you have also other examples. Many years ago, uh, China and Russia uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, this underlying melody, nuclear weapons are indispensable uh, for peace, uh, it's just a myth. And once it is clear that this uh, is not valid, perhaps it's a little bit easier to, to make progress. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. There, there's Another question here, and I think, uh, um, let me read it from the chat. Uh, what do you see the future moves of NATO countries, uh, which joined uh, the uh, first uh, meeting of state parties? Yeah, indeed, I think uh, it is only, of course, a first step. It's quite clear, you do not take a commitment when you come as an observer uh, to a conference, doesn't mean that you are joining. At the same time, you show interest and respect to the conference, to the states parties, to the treaty. And it was quite interesting, uh, um, the German foreign minister Baerbock had been just this week in Japan. And she visited some nuclear bomb sites in Nagasaki. And then she tweeted uh, that uh, uh, Germany supports the DPNW, uh, which went further than any other thing I've seen from German official supports. As, uh, that, that's uh, pretty strong. Uh, so, we are now in a phase where all these uh, uh, contra propaganda against the TPNW, uh, which in my view uh, didn't have any valuable uh, and true arguments, but uh, came about just to disparage the TPNW and to, to make sure that people might think it's not a good thing, it doesn't help in disarmament and such ideas. Uh, I think this is a little bit fading away, at least getting weaker. And some of the NATO countries are seeing the value of the TPNW. Uh, again, it would ta take uh, them to acknowledge that nuclear weapons cannot bring peace. Uh, uh, technically, legally, it's totally perfect for a NATO country to join the TPNW. There's nothing that is blocking this. Uh, in the NATO uh, treaty, there is no mention of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, but of course, in, the, um, uh, uh, in their strategy, and they had other strategies before, and we'll have new strategies in the future too. Uh, uh, there's this uh, sentence, as long as 
their nuclear weapons, uh, uh, we will have them, which is not very nice because basically it means we will never get to nuclear disarmament, even so they profess to this uh, objective, but I mean, it's like a chicken and egg game, who will be the last ones, we want to be the last ones, so it's not very realistic. Uh, but uh, I see it's an opening, and uh, certainly it is dependent on civil society to, to use this opening and uh, to uh, work on the public opinion. And the public opinion is in all NATO countries for the TPNW, not against it. But this has to be translated into politics. And, uh, uh, so, so there is a lot that still has to, to be done, um, but I see we made some progress now and hopefully this progress will intensify and uh, then over time uh, more will become possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Any, any other questions, friends? Um, so I saw that, uh, well, you know, um, uh, since Ambassador Thomas had mentioned, you know, like, um, uh, saying he just mentioned that it all depends on civil society, the peace movement, the social movements to, you know, to, to continue, uh, pursuing this. And I think that at this point, if there are no more questions, uh, we will shift to the second part. Uh, but if you have questions for Ambassador later, uh, we will have a general uh, Q&A and discussion after the presentation of our four pine, uh, panelists. Um, and just mention their name. Uh, you know, we have Hiroshi Taka of Gensikyo, Japan. We have Kate Hudson of uh, 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 Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, UK, Kim Jin Young of South Korea, and of course, uh, Dr. Tillman Ruff uh, from Australia. So we have four distinguished uh, panelists who will be you know, uh, giving us some sense as to where the movement and the civil society are headed. And let me now turn over the moderation to Anu Chenoy. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Thomas and uh, Cora for the first uh, section. And I would first ask uh, Hiroshi Santaka, uh, to speak, especially because now I think Japan is at a very critical stage where uh, the entire uh, peace movement is worried about the fact that um, around Article 9 and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the political regime actually trying to move away from pacifism. So what can you and civil society really do about this. So, uh, Hiroshi-san. We can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, I start. First of all, I thank you for the opportunity to speak at this forum with Ambassador Hainachi and so many other excellent speakers. Uh, like many of you, we too sent our delegation to the first meeting of the state parties to the TPNW. And we submitted our uh, modest suggestions and report on our effort to make Japan a party to the treaty. Unfortunately, our government refused to sign the treaty or even to send an observer to the meeting. Yet the support of the TPNW among the people in Japan is overwhelming. You can confirm it in our report put on, on, on the United Nations website. I believe that the first MST achieved a big success. First, it declared that the nuclear weapons are now explicitly and comprehensively 
prohibited for the first time by international law that the gap in the international legal regime is filled and that they, they should abide by the international law. The nuclear powers continue to refuse the TPNW saying that their nuclear arsenals are deterrence or guarantee of security. Ongoing Russian invasion against Ukraine, however, revealed that the nuclear weapons uh, are used as a not as a deterrent, not for the security, but to hedge the superpowers aggression, military attack against the uh, neighboring country. NATO's nuclear deterrence or nuclear sharing did not deter aggression either. On the contrary, if The Vienna Declaration condemned that any use or threat of use of nuclear weapons is a violation of international law and demanded that the pending the total elimination of nuclear weapons, all nuclear arms states never use or threaten to use these weapons under any circumstances. I fully support this declaration. One more important characteristic is that from the drafting to the entry into force, the whole process of the treaty has been proceeded in close cooperation between the governments, United Nations, and civil society. I think this, yeah, this the pattern of a pattern of cooperation has developed anew since the citizens stood up in protest against the Iraq war early this century and grew to the so-called second superpower. On the eve of the 2010 NPT review, review conference, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon came to our rally in New York and said before us, let, is, let, uh, let it hear our call, disarm now. To the NPT review conference in 2015 too, he sent a message and referring to the millions of signatures that we submitted, he said that these was the reminder of the people we here to, to serve, us, uh, serve. I'm quite confident that if <clears throat> uh, untiring diplomatic efforts of major uh, majority governments and the voices of uh, civil society, sovereign people in our country, in, in each country uh, combined, uh, peace and just war without new weapons will not be too far. It will soon be the 77th August since the A bombings. Despite the COVID 19, we, with careful preparation, we will convene the 2020 World Conference against the Andes bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The representatives assembled from, from around, the Japan, around Japan and all of, you know, overseas who are uh, people yeah, combined, uh, co uh, con connected online, will send uh, united voices with the Ibaksha to the 10th NPG Review Conference, which will meet in New York on August the 1st through the 26th. To, and we send the message to all states, including P5, as well as the global civil society. It will say that there should never be any use or threat of nuclear weapons, first of all, that all nuclear weapon states should fulfill their responsibility, obligation, under Article 6 to negotiate nuclear disarmament, eliminate their nuclear arsenals, achieve their peace and security of the world without nuclear weapons, and make a framework for it, as was agreed upon by the 8th NPG Review Conference. Further, they should accept the TPNW as international law supported by the overwhelming majority of the governments and the people both around the world. It will also call on, on the uh, global civil society to work in solidarity to build a, build a huge voice of the people, the sovereign people in each country who are total elimination of nuclear weapons. It is of decisive importance to build a nationwide support of a nuclear disarmament, uh, though the road was not very flat and straight. Here in Japan, in, in the next elections for the upper house through those parties that stand for the revision of the peace constitution, 
more aggressive military posture, massive increase in military expenditure, deeper reliance on UN nuclear uh, deterrence, and even the choice of nuclear sharing, obtained two thirds of the seats in the parliament, the required number for initiating the, the revision of the Japanese constitution. It was wind aired by fear from the Russian invasion against Ukraine, the nuclear tests and missile shots of North Korea, and the China's attempt to change the status quo by force combined. I do not think that our people will nevertheless so easily allow the, the dangerous path of destroying that line and war or nuclear sharing so easily. Yet certainly we are facing a challenge, cha challenging time where our movement having the broadest popular basis concerned with the survival of, uh, of humanity must make the utmost uh, efforts endeavor to straighten Japan's role. The 2022 World Conference Against the End Reforms and the International Joint Action Peace Wave for the Elimination of Nuclear Weapons to be launched soon, both on, for both on August 5th through 9th, will be our fresh start point of the struggle in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And your city, one online, please join us in it. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Hiroshi-san, uh, and we really hope that uh, uh, Japan's people and civil society succeed in keeping it, keeping their pacifist constitution and also restraining uh, Japan from actually helping NATO to come into the Asia Pacific because that is the other area of concern uh, where uh, NATO is moving, making waves and inviting uh, some of the Asian countries to its uh, conferences. So now we turn to uh, Kim uh, Jin Young. Uh, she is part of the People's Solidarity for Social Progress in South Korea. Uh, another uh, country which is facing major challenges of uh, keeping away from either going nuclear, nuclear sharing, nuclear umbrella, uh, and civil society is facing a major, major task of uh, supporting uh, NPT. Kim? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I feel honored to speak this such big speakers. Thank you all. My speech is about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, North Korea's evolving nuclear doctrine, and the role of the international anti-nuclear movement. Russia's invasion of Ukraine poses uh, the threat of nuclear catastrophe to the world. Russia's script is no first used policy in 1993. Since then, its nuclear threshold has been lowered. The Russian doctrine of use, using nuclear weapons shows that the threshold is very low today. So it is not surprising if Russia uses nuclear weapons at any time in times of war like this. The situation is similar in North Korea. Recent statements by the North Korean authorities shows their highly burdened nuclear doctrine that could launch a preemptive nuclear strike based on arbitrary interpretation. On April 5th, Kim Yeo-jung of the Workers' Party of Korea said, if South Korea chooses a military confrontation with us, our nuclear weapons will be first to do its job and will be first to use nuclear weapons to take the initiative in the early stages of the war, prevent long-term war, and preserve our military power. This is the first time the North Korean authorities have publicly announced the possibility of using nuclear weapons aimed at the South Korea, contrary to previous claims that our nuclear weapons are targeting the United States. 
In the military period on April 26, Chairman Kim Jong-un also said, we will continue to strengthen and develop nuclear weapons at the fastest pace possible, adding our nuclear weapons cannot be bound by a single mission of preventing war. If anyone tries to violate the fundamental interest of our country, they will have to carry out our up their second mission. On April 3, he said, we will firmly maintain, the, maintain and strengthen the absolute dominance of laboratory arms to preemptively and thoroughly cross all dangerous attempts and threats. In sum, this is a threat that even if they are not subject to military attacks, North Korean authorities can preempt preemptively use nuclear weapons against a comprehensive violation of their fundamental interests or all dangerous attempts and threats. And South Korea can be targeted. This year, North Korea conducted tests on ICBM, SLBM, and hypersonic missiles, and has conducted a total of 19 missile launches so far in July. The only thing left to return to the situation in 2017 when North Korea's nuclear threat reached an all-time high is its seventh nuclear test. It would not be surprising if it was conducted tomorrow because technical preparation for a nuclear tests are considered almost complete. This nuclear warheads need to be miniaturized to be mounted on tactical nuclear weapons targeting South Korea and Japan. The seventh nuclear test is expected to proceed according to the purpose of verifying the techn technology level. In a world where these threats are mounting, the path we must choose will not be to give in to those who pose nuclear threats, nor to accept the first myth of nuclear deterrence. As a task of the nuclear, uh, international anti-nuclear peace movement, we need to call for reformation of the UN. It's not only its task, of course, but it's more realistic than creating other better systems. The current UN Security Council structure, where permanent members have bit of power, is vulnerable to current members' violation of international law, as shown by the re response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This structure will not be able to effectively cope with the Russia's future use of nuclear weapons or China's invasion of Taiwan. Aside from this structural limitation, Russia and China are gradually weakening the UN according to their own interests. At a Security Council meeting held during, a, during the war in Ukraine, Russia and China refused to adopt a resolution on North Korea's test of ICBM and the Myanmar crisis, which began with a military coup in 9th 2021, the weakening of the UN, a symbol of post-war world conflict management, will lead to the reconstruction of blocks and strengthening military alliance. The second is a global campaign to dismantle nuclear weapons that can strengthen the UN and keep pressure on countries that pose nuclear threats. There is no question that the most effective tool we have now is the PPNW. The Vienna Declaration condemns the threat of using nuclear weapons by Russia and serves as a means of international pressure. The treaty and the Vienna De Declaration will also put pressure on countries like South Korea and the United States, which are conducting military ex exercises with F 35 stealth fighters in response to North Korea's possible seventh nuclear test. Unfortunately, not only does the South Korean government ignore the decree, 
the software screen society and the media do not pay much attention to the existence of this treaty. But many discussed topics such as the nuclear crisis on the Korean Peninsula, PSA nurses Asia, and the war in Ukraine, we eventually realized that the TPNW can be the answer to these problems. My job is to help more people reach this conclusion, and I promise to continue to do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kim, indeed, uh, what you said that uh, the TPNW is the most effective uh, uh, instrument towards uh, uh, in, uh, you know, nuclear disarmament is absolutely correct. And with that, we have uh, now uh, Tilman Ruff. Uh, he is going to do a PowerPoint. Uh, he is in the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons in Australia. And I might tell you that the Australian peace groups have been very effective uh, in uh, you know, showing the dangers of the AUKUS Treaty, which Australia just signed, and the possibility of Australia going nuclear. So, Tillman, uh, it's... Uh, you're muted. You're muted. We can't hear. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, let me just share my screen, if I, if I may. Are you able to see that? Yes. Great. Well, I thank Insecure for the opportunity to speak with you to discuss these um, critical issues. Uh, I'm talking to you today from the traditional lands of the Boon Wurrung people, and, and I'd like to honour their continuing custodianship of this unceded land. Fittingly, the Vienna Declaration uh, adopted at the state's parties, which um, Ambassador Hajnoshi referred to, drew attention to the failure of nuclear dependent states like NATO members, Australia, Japan and South Korea, to take any serious steps to reduce their reliance on nuclear weapons. They're clearly part of the problem at present rather than part of the solution. Shamefully, through the humanitarian initiative from which the TPNW emerged, Australia has been one of the most active of the states which came to be called weasels. Australia was arguably the most active such state um, in seeking to undermine the development of the treaty and the TPNW negotiations were in fact the first multilateral disarmament negotiations that Australia has ever boycotted. Australia's hostility to the TPNW stands in stark contrast to Australia's support and occasional leadership for the treaties which prohibit other types of indiscriminate and inhumane weapons. Important for us to understand and promote is the fact that joining the TPNW is entirely consistent with a continuing military alliance with a nuclear armed state, provided nuclear weapons related activities are excluded. 56 former heads of government, defence and foreign ministers of nuclear dependent states and two former secretary generals of NATO have very clearly stated that there is nothing in their respective defence pacts which precludes joining the TPNW. 11 of the 17 US designated major non-NATO allies voted for treaty adoption. Three of them, Thailand, the Philippines and New Zealand happily have already ratified the treaty with no disruption to their ongoing non-nuclear military cooperation with the US. In order to join the treaty, Australia would need to renounce any role for nuclear weapons and the possibility of nuclear weapons being used on behalf of Australia. Ending visits by aircraft or ships carrying nuclear weapons would be straightforward. US surface ships don't have nuclear weapons on them since 1991. 
a larger negotiated program of work would be required to end Australia's assistance in possible use of US nuclear weapons through military facilities that are involved in the command, control and targeting of nuclear weapons. The facility in Australia that's currently in the starkest violation of the Treaty Prohibition on Assistance with Prohibited Activities is the Relay Ground Station at Pine Gap, shown here. Uh, what is now a redundant add-on, which could readily be decommissioned or dismantled without affecting Pine Gap's ongoing surveillance and intelligence functions. Since May 21, so just uh, two months ago, Australia has a new government led by the Australian Labor Party. In 2018, for the Labor Party National Conference to adopt a policy committing Labor in government to sign and ratify the TPNW after taking into account a number of considerations uh, which by any objective analysis should not be obstacles. This policy was moved by current Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, shown here, and it was adopted unanimously. And the policy was reaffirmed at the National Conference last year. There are a number of tools that have been helpful for us in achieving this policy commitment by the party now holding government. And these and continued advocacy inside and outside the party and in the parliament will be important in the ongoing work to ensure that this commitment is implemented. We currently have 100 members of the federal parliament who have joined ICANN's parliamentary pledge. And this includes a full 80% of Labor members, including two thirds of the shadow cabinet. And it has broad cross-factional support within the party. You can see many of the 80 people there in all their diversity. Repeated opinion polls have shown that the previous government's strident opposition to the treaty, um, despite that, 71 to 79% of the public want Australia to join this treaty. 39 local governments, as well as the peak Australian Local Government Association, unanimously support Australia joining the treaty, as do a very broad range of civil society organisations, including the trade union movement, which is an important base uh, for Labor. Cities have been an important tool. It's clearly the first responsibility of every level of government uh, to protect its citizens. And some of those cities have done wonderful work promoting their initiative, for example, here uh, with cultural activities, a mural honouring uh, the Lester family of nuclear test survivors. Some of you will have heard um, Karina Lester speak. Divestment work is also bearing fruit and helping to promote the ban and stigmatise nuclear weapons and those who profit from their manufacture. While investments in nuclear weapons manufacturers are, are large and widespread in our financial sector, we've so far been able to convince nine financial institutions, including one bank and eight pension funds, to, include, to exclude investing in nuclear weapons producers. And from this year, the Responsible Investment Association of Australia, which certifies all financial products in Australia that want to claim to be ethical or socially responsible, all such products in future will be required to exclude nuclear weapons investments. So I think there are real prospects that Australia can be the first nuclear dependent state uh, to join the treaty. Of course, we very much hope so. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we also hope that uh, Australia will, it's very critical for us in the Asia Pacific that uh, Australia and all of you are successful in making Australia 
uh, joined the joined this treaty. And uh, now um, we have our last speaker, but a very important speaker, Kate Hudson, uh, who is part of the campaign for nuclear disarmament and has given a lot of very creative ideas of how we can move forward and how uh, we can expand the, the TPNW. And I think maybe you can address some of uh, your experiences in mobilizing civil society. Thank you, Kate. Thanks very much indeed. And thanks for inviting me to this very timely event. So Britain's hostility to the TPNW is well known. And unfortunately, the challenges that our movement faces in overcoming that hostility are increasing rather than decreasing. This is a difficult place to be in, but it's symptomatic of the enormous challenges currently facing global society. Since the TPNW came into force at the beginning of last year, there have been significant changes with regard to Britain's nuclear weapons. In March of last year, the government published its integrated review, a lurch towards massively increased militarization with an increase in the nuclear arsenal of over 40%. This was a reversal of decades of gradual reductions. Alongside this was an increase in the number of scenarios in which nuclear weapons may be used. Legal opinion, of course, found these illegal under international law. In the autumn of last year, the UK government joined AUKUS with the US and Australia, an agreement which has the provision of nuclear powered submarines to Australia at its heart, not to mention basing facilities for UK forces. In April this year, we discovered, thanks to Hans Christensen's forensic research, that the US plans to bring its freefall nuclear bombs assigned to NATO back to Britain. Indeed, they may already be here. These are the same nuclear bombs that are already in several NATO countries across Western Europe. If the war in Ukraine goes nuclear, these are the weapons that will be used. Our government refuses to comment. So at a time of significant global crises that require global cooperation, like the climate emergency, pandemics, resource shortages, migration waves, and now the economic crisis, Britain is actively contributing to global division and confrontation. And rejecting the TPNW out of hand is part of this negative orientation. This is in stark contrast to the global leadership shown by the countries of the global south, which overwhelmingly support and champion the TPNW. Sometimes when we feel embattled here in Britain, we have to remind ourselves that we are part of the global majority and it's our government that is in the minority. This is true not only in terms of global opinion, but also opinion in Britain itself. When the TPNW came into force, we commissioned an opinion poll, which showed that a significant majority of people in Britain across all demographics want nuclear weapons to be banned, and a majority want Britain to sign up to the TPNW. Yet when we lobby the government and our parliamentarians, the answer is always the same, that the TPNW is damaging to the NPT and the British government is committed to the NPT. And this is the same government that is breaching the NPT with its warhead increases. In the run up to the first meeting of states parties to the TPNW in Vienna, we carried out a lobbying campaign to get our government to send an observer to the conference. We received considerable support from civil society and of course from our cross-party parliamentary group, Parliamentary CND. Of course, the government didn't send anyone and the only parliamentarian from the Westminster Parliament to attend was Bell Ribeiro Addy 
a vice chair of parliamentary CND. At the time, we were very pleased to see that Germany and Norway, both NATO states, and Germany, one of the states that hosts US NATO nukes, sent observers. However, in retrospect, we can see that there are problems with this form of participation. Both Germany and Norway used the opportunity of their statements to the conference to reiterate their support for NATO nuclear policy, which is to remain a nuclear armed alliance as long as nuclear weapons exist. But their role went beyond that, also using their statements to work against the possibility of the TPNW becoming customary international law and becoming persistent objectors to the treaty and that status. As Germany stated, as non-members to the TPNW, we are not bound by its provisions under customary law now or in the future. While Germany and Norway were in the lead on this, Sweden also made a similar contribution, not surprising in light of its status as an imminent member of NATO. The recent Russian invasion of Ukraine has very much strengthened the hand of NATO in Europe and intensified the militarization of the continent. This is clear in Germany, where its decades long anti militarist culture is being rapidly overturned. So, the idea of wanting Britain to attend TPNW conferences loses its desirability. And together with the shifting military context in Europe, we are required to rethink our strategic approach to the British government. Of course, there is much else that we are doing on the ground and strengthening the anti-nuclear movement is ongoing. We have a strong public response to our campaigning with the increasing public fears of nuclear war for the first time since the end of the Cold War. Continuing to build public support for the TPNW is part of the wider anti-nuclear campaign and our key grassroots focus is on winning more local authorities, towns and cities to support the TPNW. Our nuclear ban communities campaign is growing and we are seeing more mayors and councils commit to the treaty. In the current political context, this work is more important than ever, not just in Britain, but globally, to roll back the nuclear danger with its increasing risk of annihilation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate, for that excellent uh, analysis and briefing us on what's happening uh, in, in the UK. Uh, and now we do have some time for question answers. I can see one question in Japanese. So I think Cora will, uh, uh, will read that in, because I, I can't read Japanese, so uh, would you do that, uh, Cora? Read this question. Uh, um, it's actually not yet the question. Um, <laughs> I know it's actually a uh, you know like um, an information that uh, they can post their question in the chat box or in the Q and A box. Um, so neither. <laughs> I can't also read Japanese. <laughs> so maybe our interpreters can help us with that. But I have not seen. Uh, 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 well, it says here, question to Tillman Ra. Shall I read it? Yes. How can your people achieve the change of the government? That's a question coming from well one of our uh, attendees actually so that seems to be directed to tillman sure well um i mean obviously you know democratic elections uh, can do that which is a, a happy thing in, in in many places still um but i think the you know the morrison government um 
you know, there are many reasons for its its loss, and I think the widely anticipated um, election of a new government. Um, what uh, many factors, uh, and and this issue was, you know, probably not central in in people's minds. Um, you know, these are always complicated things, and people weigh up a whole lot of issues, um, often more parochial and personal, uh, in terms of their own well being and economic situation. Um, but there was really a comprehensive set of, of, um, of issues. I think climate change uh, high on the list, um, the failure of the previous government really to have a serious energy and um, energy transition plan, um, multiple repeated evidence of corruption at high levels in, in our national um, body politic that the government refused to address um, repeated issues of, of um, abuse along gender and, and sexual orientation lines that, that really went right up and down the political um, system that were also extremely poorly uh, addressed. Um, delays and failures in providing vaccines for, for COVID and other aspects of the COVID um, response. Um, one of the interesting things, though, that um, I think those of you outside Australia may not be aware of, which I think is also extremely positive and extremely interesting, is that this is the first election in Australia where the duopoly um, of two major parties um, really was broken in a very comprehensive way. Uh, we have a sort of a complicated federal system with um, voting in the House of Representatives, the lower house where the government is formed by the party that can muster a majority, um, essentially is a first past the post system. But then in the Senate, which is um, in some ways very undemocratic because it's based on states, but it does have proportional representation. So there's been a long history of independents, minor parties, Greens uh, and others having the balance of power in the Senate. But there's never been a history of um, really, except for a few years, uh, a number of years ago under Julia Gillard, the first female prime minister we had, of minor parties, non-Labour and coalition holding the balance of power in the lower house. But at this election, the votes of both the major parties actually um, I mean, the Liberals and the Nationals, the Conservative coalition really plummeted. But Labor's increase was really very modest. And much of the, the really big news in the election was that there were a doubling of the number of Greens who were elected um, and an unprecedented number of independent, progressive, largely incredibly impressive women um, the so-called Teal group, um, who are independent but who campaigned across climate issues, corruption, gender issues, um, and others, but particularly climate, and who I think will transform uh, Australian parliamentary processes in, in a very healthy way. Um, so certainly, for most of us, you know, speaking personally, I have to say. You know, it was a blessed relief to have the end of the previous government on this issue. Um, there is, of course, Labor in, in government has often disappointed us before, but the possibility for progress um, on particularly nuclear issues and nuclear weapons issues here is, is now very real and very much stronger with a party, uh, with a policy platform to join the treaty with a prime minister who has been a major champion of that position um, and with uh, much more reasonable policies all around. Um, so I think there is real opportunity for progress, but of course the translation from party policy to implementation is not automatic or direct. And it's absolutely critical that, that we use every opportunity now to, to increase the pressure and internationally, um, you know, I'd, I'd all encourage all of you on this call to, to use any opportunity for international events. Um, if you come across Australian representatives, um, please uh, 
encourage them in to in joining the treaty. Um, it's a it's a hopeful time, but of course our, our our work is far from from finished. Thank you. So there's one more question from Nihama, who says. It's a comment. It says, I think that unless we eliminate nuclear weapons, nuclear threats will go away. What do you think? I think she means that unless we do not, unless we eliminate nuclear weapons until then nuclear, only then nuclear threats will go away. So um, uh, would um, Hiroshi like to answer this question? I'm sorry, I can't quite the, uh, get the what, what the, uh, the, the sense of the question. The nuclear and nuclear threats will go away. What does it mean? I think actually it's a fact that obviously nuclear threats will go away on, only after we eliminate nuclear weapons. So I don't think it really needs an answer. But if there are any mm -hmm. other questions, um, I can't see any other questions. Uh, there's a question in the Q&A. Oh, from Kale, yes, from Kale, there's one more question. Uh, Scottish is, what, is the, yeah, what is the current stand of the Scottish National Party? And are the Scottish MPs in the UK Parliament supporting the treaty? I think that's to Kate. Kate? <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, this is a um, very uh, good and interesting question, particularly for the political situation here in Britain. So um, not all Scottish MPs in the Westminster Parliament are from the Scottish National Party, but the overwhelming majority are. And the Scottish National Party has a position which uh, supports the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And I have to say that the SNP has a, a very strong track record in the nuclear disarmament movement. In fact, the chair of parliamentary CND is a, a, a senior member, a senior MP from the Scottish National Party. So we're, we're very fortunate. Um, and of course, as people may know, Britain's nuclear weapons, the Trident submarine nuclear weapons system, they are located, they're based in Scotland at the Faslane Naval Base. So um, this, of course, is a huge uh, bone of contention within the union as it currently exists. And of course, it's one of the factors which leads many people to support an independent Scotland, um, particularly within Scotland, because the position of the SNP is that they would expel those nuclear weapons from Scotland and they would be enthusiastic signatories to the TPNW. Uh, at the moment there's a big discussion going on up there about um, Scotland's membership of NATO. Um, would they be allowed to, I think there's the SNP position is currently to support NATO membership but they wish to be a non-nuclear member of NATO, but there's a whole debate about whether they would be allowed to join NATO if they expelled British nukes from their lands or their seas. So um, that, that's an, an ongoing debate, but certainly the role of the uh, anti-nuclear Scottish MPs is very, very valuable in our parliamentary work. And of course, it's a, it's a, a, a leading light in our work um, across the union as it currently exists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. And there's a question from Bal Krishna from India. And he says, India and Pakistan are nuclear weapon states. Unfortunately, there is a misunderstanding and animosity amongst these two states. And due to this misunderstanding, zealous military officers, a nuclear war can start in South Asia. Now his question is, 
to or any any of the speakers can answer it. He says, how to work on the procedure to minimize the nuclear threats and how to convenience or convince these two states to sign the nuclear ban treaty. So that's his question. I think if uh, Tillman can answer that. Sorry, I hadn't put my hand up in relation to, to that question, but I, okay. but I, 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 I maybe make a brief comment on that. Um, I do think that the treaty has a potentially important role in helping to serve regional functions as well as global ones. And by that, I mean, one could envisage a situation where as part of a regional denuclearization, a regional reduction of tensions and, and peace building process, whether it be in Northeast Asia, uh, involving the Koreas, uh, you know, Russia, China, Japan, potentially, or in South Asia, um, or potentially even in the Middle East, or other regions of tension, all of the relevant parties joining the TPNW as part of such a regional approach um, could in fact serve a very useful function. I mean, joining the TPNW is really the most effective way for nations to demonstrate that they are actually serious about disarmament. And I think that's one of the utilities of this treaty. It's really the litmus test. You know, there's no more fluffing and and smoke screens and, and Orwellian language. Um, if states are serious about disarmament, they will support this treaty. If they don't, frankly, they are not. And I think that's been being amply proven in, in, in all of the, the developments um, internationally since, um, since the treaty. So the treaty is really the only positive development um, in the nuclear weapons landscape at present. And the treaty has a number of, of really unique features. And the particular one in this context is that it, it is the only internationally agreed plan for available to all states, hosting nuclear weapons, owning nuclear weapons, nuclear dependent, or having nothing to do with nuclear weapons, the only internationally agreed plan for all of them to fulfill their disarmament obligations and eliminate nuclear weapons. It is by necessity a framework, a broad framework that will require much more detail uh, when the nuclear armed states actually join and get serious about disarmament. But in its broad principles, in the immediate uh, taking weapons off alert, in its addressing not just the weapons, but the facilities and the programs that produce them, in its requirements for time-bound, verified plans approved and, and, and subject to inspections by a competent international authority, uh, it provides a clear roadmap for the elimination of nuclear weapons. It provides flexibility about whether nuclear armed states disarm and then join or join and then disarm. I mean, frankly, I think none of us really care how they get rid of their weapons as long as they do it. Um, but I think the treaty has a really important role that will become more important over time of being the only internationally defined blueprint um, to actually get rid of weapons. I just wanted to make one other brief comment before is from a previous item. Is that okay? Sorry to, to say more, but I just didn't no. want to leave the impression that I was, that we've only been working with the Australian Labor Party in, in Australia. Um, we regard this issue as, as a fundamental cross-cutting humanitarian issue that should be above party politics. And it's noteworthy in Australia that some of the treaties that ban indiscriminate and inhumane weapons that we've joined, the governments that joined were Labor governments, there are others like the landmines ban that have been conservative governments that have joined them. So it's really important that this be promoted by us and seen as a cross-cutting humanitarian issue and not a partisan one. 
And one of the helpful ways that we've been promoting that is by having a cross-party parliamentary Friends of the Treaty group, which is chaired by a Labor member, a Green member and a Conservative member and is a safe space for parliamentarians to be updated on the issues and to, and to discuss it. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, ICANN is clearly not picking favourites among political parties. Thank you. Okay, there's one there's one question in, in Japanese. So maybe Yayoi, uh, you can read it out. Tell us what it is. Uh, is Yayoi there? Otherwise, there's another question from the US from Amy Bloom, Blumenshine, who says, as a US activist, I would like to know how the rest of the world viewed their nuclear risk in regard to our presidential crisis. That is, who could push the button? Um, Ambassador Thomas, would you like to react to this question? Okay, from it's better. Yeah. It's this famous theory of nuclear deterrence presupposes that uh, political leaders would act totally rationally. And I think we had a very good example that uh, this is not always the case. When President Trump was the president of the United States and uh, uh, we have to be fair, I think there are also other political leaders uh, where we have some doubts concerning whether they would always take their decisions in the best informed and totally rational way. Uh, then there's the additional factor that is so much psychological pressure, especially in a moment of uh, crisis, uh, that uh, we cannot expect even a very enlightened leader to take a decision uh, that cannot be based on sufficient information in a very rational way, at least ex post, it might look as irrational. Um, so that shows again that this whole theory of nuclear deterrence uh, cannot uh, be considered as a uh, practical way to deal with nuclear weapons. And